Good evening and welcome to the virtual panel discussion for the Dildelians, a story of photography and survival film premiere. My name is Zara Ali and I'm welcome, welcome to the virtual panel discussion, discussion for the Dildelians, a story of photography and survival film premiere. My name is Zara Ali and I'm welcome to the virtual panel discussion for the Dildelians, a story of photography and survival film premiere. My name is Zara Ali, and I'm one for the opening discussion for the Dildelian, a story of the taxi and survival only. Apologies for technical difficulties. My name is Zara Ali, and I'm the Director for Global Partnerships and Outreach at the University of Connecticut. I'll be your MC tonight. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout. We had 180 people watching the premiere. I hope everyone is ready for an engaging discussion now. Please submit your questions in the chat in YouTube and our team will get it over to the panelists. Tonight, our moderator will be Heather L Elliott Famularo, Department Head of Digital Media and Design and Donna Kranicki, Professor of Digital Media and Design at UConn. She is an award-winning filmmaker and artist active in the fields of broadcast television, computer graphics and interactive multimedia with a focus on collaborative digital humanities and public education through digital media. Her research has had a focus on the Holocaust and genocide since 2005. She serves on the Ohio Council on Holocaust and Genocide Education. She has presented as well as published and exhibited her work internationally in Canada, Hungary, Italy, and Poland, as well as at IDMAA and SIGGRAPH, where she has also acted as curator and juror of numerous ex exhibitions. She's currently the head of the digital media and design department at the University of Connecticut and is affiliated faculty in Judaic studies at UConn. Our first panelist will be Armin Marsubian, the Dildelian family historian and professor of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State University. He is the grandson of Solag Dildelian. Dildelian was the founder of the Dildelian Family Archive, a collection of photographs, documents, and memoirs created by the members of the Dildelian family in the years before, during, and after the Armenian Genocide. Professor Marsubian has written several books regarding Armenian history and his family's role and experiences in it. Our second panelist is Catherine Massoud, an award-winning winning filmmaker with over 25 years of experience in producing, directing, and editing working in both documentary and fictional genres. Thematically, many of her films address social justice issues and the conflict between religious and cultural identity. Her films have screened at major festivals, been theatrically released in many countries, and broadcast on such outlets as Turner Classic Mu Movies, Channel 4 in the UK, TV Ontario, and SBS Australia. She has received grants for her work from UNESCO, the Ford Foundation, the US Department of State, Hubert Balls Fund in the Nether Netherlands, DFID from the UK, and the French government South Fund, among others. Her association with UConn dates back to 2016, when the Human Rights Institute hosted a selection of her films. In fall 2018, she received a special appointment from the Human Rights Institute to teach variable topics course entitled Social Documentary and Theory and Practice. This last academic year in 2019-20, she taught two variable topics courses in digital media and design, social justice documentary and visual representations of Armenian memory, the course that produced the film you just watched and that we'll discuss now. They're also joined by our three student filmmakers who took part in the course, Aidan Bruckner, Jonathan Pico, and Bridget Sweeney, all of whom are seniors and will be graduating in 2021. Our, the co-sponsors for this event tonight is the Noreen Armenian Programs, Office of Global Affairs, School of Social Work, Human Rights Institute, Digital Media and Design at the University of Connecticut, the Arat Iskijin Museum, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and Project Save Armenian Photographic Archives. We'll hear from some of our co-sponsors at the end of the panel discussion. Thanks for tuning in tonight, and I now pass it over to Heather to get us started. Thanks so much, Sarah. So tonight we are celebrating the first outcomes of a broader initiative that was first conceptualized in 2017 when Vice President for Global Affairs at UConn, Daniel Weiner, had a vision to recreate and remember the communities lost to war and genocide in Armenia, Germany, and more recently Syria. A project that would showcase the religious diversity, culture, and architecture of the countries before the genocides and wars that ravaged them. 
The first project initiated to realize this vision would be the Armenian Memory Project. Under the umbrella of the Norian Armenian, Armenian programs, co-chaired by the Office of Global Affairs and the School of Social Work. The mission of Yukon's Norian Armenian programs is to educate the Yukon community and the broader public about Armenian culture and history and by providing forums for Armenians and Armenian Americans to share knowledge and traditions. To further this mission, Norian Armenian pro programs builds partnerships with institutions in addition to supporting academic projects, research travel, and publications that further the dissemination of information about Armenian culture, history, and society. We are fortunate to bring in key partners across campus, as well as collaborators from the Armenian community in Connecticut and the Northeast. Due to the wonderful relationship between these partners and the significance of the topic, the Armenian Genocide, we <clears throat> began to explore the family photo photographic archives of Armin Marsubian through a pair of UConn courses, digital media and design, students first work with the Dedillion Collection and Professor Anna Lindemann's Motion Graphics One course in spring 2019. And a collection of those animations were screened at the Discovering Armenian History and Culture event in Hartford in March 2019. And the, docu the documentary film that you just saw, which incorporates some of those animations, was created in fall 2019 in a special topics course visual representations of Armenian memory, taught by filmmaker and panelist Catherine Massoud. The film tells the multidimensional story of lost Armenian history and culture through the lens of an Armenian family, the Dedillians of the city of Marzavan, and their archive of family photographs and chronicles the family's attempt to put the fragments of their lives back together after the genocide in Turkey and beyond. This class served as a pilot project, and we have hopes for a larger initiative to recreate the lost worlds of Western Armenian communities that once flourished on their historic homelands, but no longer exist in present day Turkey. Reviving communal life, cultural, religious, educational, and economic practices that this initiative aims to create a multidimensional world, perhaps in a virtual environment from largely prince based sources. In spring 2021, Catherine will be teaching another DMD special topics course, Visual Storytelling Through Human Rights Archives, with a specific focus on the Thomas J. Dodd Nuremberg Trial Collections held at the University of Connecticut Libraries Archives and Special Collections. I'd also like to remind our audience on YouTube to please type in your questions for the panelists into the comment box during this session so that we can answer them. Welcome to all of our panelists. And I'd like you to, if, if you'd like to say a few words, and, and students, if you could please introduce yourselves. We'll start off with Armin. I want to quickly remind everyone on the panel to make sure if you have YouTube on, please mute YouTube um, or close it. Armin, you're muted. Greetings. Uh, welcome to this evening's panel. I'm uh, pleased that we had such a large turnout on an evening such as this. Uh, I do want to begin before talking briefly about the course and the, uh, the project itself. I want to talk about the situation that it's ha happening right now in Armenia. The Armenian people are again facing an existential moment in our history, one uh, that my grandparents uh, faced in 1915, that is depicted in the film that you just saw. Uh, we Armenians are unfortunately not living in a post-genocidal society. Uh, many of us are living in an extension of genocide from 1915. Uh, the genocide is ever present in our lives, even when these incidents, these the violence that we see in, in Artshak, Mogona Karabakh is not happening. It's always present in our, our minds, but it's particularly present at this moment. And that's why this, uh, I think this film is, is, is an appropriate film to see at this moment, because it's, capturing a place and a time and lives of Armenians, of our, an our ancestors. This, this landscape 
that was uh, the Armenian landscape in the Armenian plateau and in Anatolia, and also in the Caucasus, was destroyed during the Armenian genocide. And it's facing threats right now as we speak and we hold this, this panel. Um, in 1915, Armenians felt abandoned by the world. And I'm sorry to say, many Armenians are feeling that today in the fact that uh, the uh, world has in many cases, little noticed what is going on in the Caucasus. Um, and Armenians back in 1915 survived mostly because of their own resources. And that's what they're doing today in Nagorno-Karabakh. So I would like to urge those listening to this, and I know many of you are Armenians, uh, and many of you who are Armenians have already reached out to support the Armenians there in Armenia and in Karabakh, and I urge you to continue that support, because in a, in a way we have to count on ourselves in this struggle. Now let me say a few things about the project, the Armenian Memory Project. Um, as was mentioned, this is a collaborative project with Project SAVE and Nasser, who will uh, be uh, speaking to you, people from both both Project SAVE and Nasser will be speaking at the end of, end of the panel. Um, and we, we hope to bring and involve other Armenian organizations in this project. This was just the first step. Uh, we're reaching out to other other organizations. We also have another co-sponsor is our Estigian Museum in, in California. This project uh, really is a continuation of my own work that began over a decade ago when I began researching my family's story. And that research resulted in number of books and I've lectured all over the world. I've had many exhibitions and I've been fortunate to teach courses on uh, the Armenian experience and the Armenian genocide, uh, both at my university and other institutions. And the students who were in this panel were privileged to hear me when I visited the class that was constructing constructing this, this film. Um, now, when I say this was a project that I began with over a decade ago, as you saw from the film, it was it was a family project. My ancestors, my grandfather and his uh, siblings and uh, children, all made an effort to preserve the life that they lived in Anatolia, in Marzavan, in Samsun, in Sivas. Uh, they were the ones who, at great peril, um, kept this story alive and brought the material eventually to the United States that you just saw a sampling of. Um, the, the, the archive that, that this, this film was based on consists of hundreds of photographs, probably six, seven hundred photographs from the Ottoman era and thousands taken afterwards in Greece and the United States. But besides that, there are memoirs and other documents besides the photos and also um, stories, stories that were passed on to me that I've been privileged to pass on to these students. And the importance of storytelling, I think, is captured in this film. And the students themselves had individual projects that they will talk to you about in which they were telling their own stories. I think that it's, it's important um, for what we're doing uh, in this project, but also more generally in the kind of memory work that I'm, I'm engaged in, uh, to try to uh, bear witness to those ancestors, whether they're Armenian ancestors uh, in, in Ottoman 
Turkey or their ancestors in Ireland as uh, Bridget's ancestors uh, came from, from those shores. It's important to give those ancestors a voice and it's also important for our own identity to understand who we are and where we've come from. Uh, as as uh, some of you might know, I am a philosopher, and at times I get the privilege of thinking a bit more philosophically about the archival work and the storytelling work I do. And this is where I think the importance of these stories uh, is, is the importance of these stories uh, it highlights the, the, the role that they can play in creating and fostering dialogue among different people. Unfortunately, today, that's very difficult to do in Turkey, where I had many of my exhibitions. But I have reached certain people there, and I hope that dialogue will continue, and I hope this film will uh, be a part of that that dialogue. The uh, the other dimension of of this, as I said, is giving voice to our ancestors, ancestors whose voice was silenced by the injustice of the genocide. And I want to quote from a piece that both Catherine Masood and I wrote about our experience in creating this course. Uh, and also create helping the students create this film. I'll, I'll conclude with these these words at the conclusion of the, the piece that we, we co-wrote. Yet by giving our ancestors a voice, we emphasize the validity and authority of their experience. The story we strove to tell, and I say we, the students in this class, is the story they told in the archives they left behind. Not all personal archives are as rich and as varied as the one that the Gildillians have created. But even when the fragments are spare and incomplete, something of meaning can be expressed through them. By giving voice, we assert and reassert the moral agency and the status of those who have suffered injustice in the past. And we hope that we have done them justice by doing so. So thank you. And now I believe I'll turn it over to Catherine for a few words about the actual course. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's really a wonderful privilege um, to be here um, amongst so many friends and well-wishers. Um, and um, I just, I'm not going to really go into detail right now about the course, the structure of the course. Um, I just wanted to also give a little bit of my own perspective on this project and what it meant for me. Um, as uh, Zara mentioned in her introduction, I am a filmmaker who's done a lot of work over the years addressing themes of genocide, war, and national memory um, in other contexts, uh, mainly South Asia. Um, but also for the last few years, I've been designing and teaching specialized courses at UConn um, on documentary practice and human rights related themes, of which this course was. Um, was one of the most meaningful. So, you know, I was really delighted then to have the opportunity to work on this collaborative teaching and production project relating to the Armenian genocide as told through the lens of a personal family archive, um, particularly an archive as rich and meaningful as the Dildilian uh, photography archive. So it's really been um, it's been a personal journey for me as well to delve more deeply into this part of history, which is so little known outside the Armenian community, but is so important to understanding the continuing conflicts that reverberate in our world today, as evidence right now, in fact, with, with what's happening in that region. Um, so in a sense, an understanding of the past is crucial, not only to understanding the present, but also to charting a path toward a more 
peaceful and just future, we hope um, that we will move in that direction anyway. Uh, but I'm, I'm very thankful to Armin for sharing his family story with so many people all over the world and for his generous participation during our work um, for this course. Um, but I also want to take this opportunity to thank the University of Connecticut's Department of uh, Digital Media and Design, the Human Rights Institute, Global Affairs, and our Armenian community partners uh, for the opportunity to be part of the Armenian Memory Project, which has been a, such a moving experience for me. And also, of course, I want to express my thanks to the organizers of this premier program. Um, again, I'm, uh, I think, you know, we'll leave more specific uh, commentary on the thinking behind and the designing and structure of the course for the follow up um, discussion. Um, so I will hand it over now to the students to give their introductions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Masud. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Aiden. I am a senior at the University of Connecticut. I'm an honors student. Um, my major is digital media and design with a concentration in digital culture, learning and advocacy. My minor is in human rights. Um, and I had just an amazing time working on this project with everybody. So I would also like to extend my gratitude to Professor Masood, to Professor Marsubian, to Professor uh, Elio Tamilaro, and everybody else at the University of Connecticut and who has helped out here. Um, my role in this project was in terms of um, working with a lot of the script and the order in which the uh, topics covered were discussed. Um, I, I participated in, in the interview. I was the one asking the questions behind the camera. Um, and then I also helped out with ordering those questions because we had probably around 45 minutes to an hour's worth of interview content, which we had to chop down pretty significantly. Uh, but that's, that's how editing goes. I also helped out with some of the sound, some of the animations that you saw, uh, including some of the recoloring of the historical photographs. Um, and I believe that just about covers it. Um, Professor Marsubian mentioned earlier that we all had a chance to work on our own personal project. Um, I was uh, inspired by the one we were already telling, and I just wanted to focus more on the story specifically of the students who were in, in the town that the Dildillians lived in at Anatolia College. Um, because I believe that there is a very relevant parallel that we can draw between the area of education and that of the, the horrible atrocities that were committed um, all those years ago. Um, and one, it's definitely a lesson that we can, that everybody can take away from. Um, and I would like to uh, just thank everybody once again, and I'll I'll pass it on to uh, the other students. Thank you, Aiden. And I just want to say thank you to everyone else who was a part of this uh, filmmaking. It was just a such a surreal experience, you know, just learning about the Armenian history, which by up to then I really didn't really know much about it. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pico. I'm a senior in digital media and design program with a concentration in 3D animation. And throughout this project, I was, I helped out a lot with the sound with the boom mic um, during the interview when Aiden was talking with Armin. I was the one holding the boom mic for a long period of time. Um, so that was more of the uh, heavy lifting work. Um, but I also got to help out with the camera work and the post-production work where we would uh, connect all the clips together and composite all the uh, animations and the uh, pictures that we altered throughout, through Photoshop, which is an Adobe software program. And with 
And I also made uh, my own project as the final where I took a little more, took it in a little more personal route where I focused on my, my journey as an adopt, adopted child where I was adopted in China um, by American parents and I was brought over when I was about one years old. And I really, really enjoyed taking this opportunity that this class has given me to understand how images and uh, video can really tell a lot more about one's journey through throughout time. And yeah, I just wanna say thank you again, for everyone coming out here and watching us and watching the film. It was, it, it took a while, but I, it all, it turned out amazing. So I think now I'm gonna hand it over to Bridget. Hi everyone, um, my name is Bridget Sweeney. Uh, just to echo off of my classmates, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, special thank you to Professor Masubi and Professor Marsubian. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm also a senior digital media and design major with a concentration in digital culture learning and advocacy and a minor in human rights. And throughout this project, I mostly served as a team archivist. I organized all of our materials. I suggested which documents and photographs we should use for each sequence. Um, I also scanned the documents and the photographs um, as well as helping with some of the special effects. So thank you all again for coming tonight and I hope you enjoyed it. Well, thanks to all of you. I just wanna say how wonderful it is to hear the students' perspective. I mean, the reason that we do all of this work as professors, as, the, as academics, and the reason why we look at history in this way is really for your generation to understand it and to you know, be able to move forward with impact in the world as a result of the knowledge that you gain. So it was really wonderful um, to see that. We've got a lot of questions here. So I'm gonna move right into um, a little bit about, so we've just, but the students move right into talking about the class structure. So Catherine, um, can you talk a little bit about how you structured the class and what kinds of activities the students did through the process um, of sort of taking all of these incredible archival materials in and learning about the Armenian genocide, which they may not have known much about? Sure. Uh, thank you, um, Heather, and thank you. It was wonderful also to hear from the students. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, we we had a dry, we had a trial run, I would say, with um, in a way with Anna Lindemann's motion graphics class that you mentioned, uh, because we were quite sure how we were going to go about structuring a course which combined elements of history and personal archiving with, you know, actual production. Um, so it, you know, what we found from the experience of the, of the motion graphics class is that it really worked to start out with a physical introduction to the archive, to bring that into the classroom, to have the students handle this, you know, this material um, and make it palpable, because it is something that, you know, happened over 100 years ago. And so we do have some photographs, actually, of the physical archives that Armin brought into the classroom. And on the right, you see a box there of glass negatives, glass negatives that survived, um, you know, uh, ship journeys um, from Turkey to Greece, and then uh, a terrible um, earthquake in Greece, and then were brought over to the United States, um, all, you know, uh, perfectly preserved and intact. So, you know, it was wonderful for them to, to see these things. And then we also found, um, that it was very useful to contextualize um, not just the archive itself, but the whole, the you know sort of the wider history of that time of Ottoman, Ottoman Ottoman Armenia and the Armenian genocide. So when we were designing the full fall semester course, um, the first half of the class was you know really heavily weighted towards that contextualization of the story um, through readings and films and. Um, guest lectures, um, and um, and also we made uh, some. We made a, a class trip to the Armenian Museum in Watertown, Massachusetts, and also met with the people at Project Save, as you see here in this picture. Here is at the Armenian Museum, 
Um, so all of this to kind of bring it into the present, you know, for this new generation who would be again telling the story, maybe to pass on to another generation, perhaps, right? Um, so then, in the second half half of the course, uh, we really began to move into the production. By this time, we'd taken Armin's interview. We decided that Armin was going to be the narrator of the story, the natural narrator. But along with his voice, as you've seen in the film, we also have his um, his mother and his uncle um as narrators as well so you hear their voices uh telling the story together with armin um and then you know the rest of the work really became very team centered as this in group of incredibly talented students with you know different types of skill sets whether it was research or writing or editing um you know photo retouching motion graphics all of these things sort of came together as we began this whole process of of um you know assembling a story from the materials at hand you know the archive on the one hand um and that includes documents uh and audio and um photographs of course narrator and the supporting family voices so that was sort of an ongoing very dynamic process um, to create this group production and um and there was a continual you know phases of revision as we went through it um and then once we were nearing the end of that they began their own individual reflection projects um which we called individual creative projects actually where they took that sort of learning around the importance of memory and archives, this concept of witnessing, which we talked about a lot in the class, um, and its connection to social justice, um, and bringing that into their own, the stories that they wanted to tell, whether it was a personal family story, or it was something that was related to um, the work that we've been doing with the Dildilian Ar Archive and the Armenian Genocide. And each of them came up with their own, you know, wonderful ideas, um, it was really exciting, you know, to see where that led. So um, that was sort of the the overall, I would say, um, structure of the course as it developed. And, you know, it was really an extremely collaborative process throughout. I mean, I was really humbled by, you know, all I had to learn also from the students and from Armin. And, um, and you know, it just shows that when you really kind of join together in this kind of process, um, you know, you can you can really come out with, uh, you know, beautiful stories um, and and films. So yes, that's that's sort of the overview, I would say. Well, it was pretty amazing to see all of um, those photographs uh, about your experience, and I'm really interested in for the students. You know, what did you feel about um, what it was like digging into Armin's archives and to hold the objects and to go to the Armenian Museum in Massachusetts? You know, how, how did that, um, you know, what was that like for you? Um, I think that even more than ever, because of the uh, current world situation we live in, we have such an appreciation for physical objects and for being able to hold history or see history in person. Um, and I think that the aspect of archival and of these museums is just in, incredibly important, uh, is incredibly important and was incredible project. Um, there's, you know, we can, we can do interviews as much as we want. We can, you know, create our own motion graphics as much as we want, but there is so much learning that can be held and so much more of an appreciation that can be gained from seeing these these pieces of history and knowing that you know it was it was another human's hands that you know cr crafted it and influenced it and brought it to where you are today um so like you know specifically the glass negatives that we got a chance to hold were amazing that's that's a piece of not only uh, the Dildillian family history, but of photographic history as well. Um, and it was important for us to really try and accentuate that when we were when we were making this project. Bridget or Jonathan, did you want to add anything? Uh, 
Yeah, basically just to um, go off of what Aiden said, um, holding the glass negatives was definitely something that really um, resonated with me. I've never even held the glass negative before that class. And to think that they've been around for so long was so, so incredible. And I really enjoyed um, holding the physical archives. Yeah, I was I was just amazed at how much archival stuff we were able to find, um, given what happened um, in the Armenian history. And when we went to the museum in Massachusetts, I was just taken away by just how much stuff there was. I uh, specifically one thing that I saw that kind of caught my eye was this doll um, in this class that was that had um, clothing that. Uh, one would wear, uh, one Armenian would wear um, back then. And I thought it was just interesting, you know, how um, that that doll, you know, could have been a child who was um, who was killed in the genocide. And that just kind of uh, really resonated with me and just imagining that um, and really just uh, really just understanding how how big this this Armenian history was. And with the photographs that Armin showed us during class, uh, they were very helpful in uh, putting together the storytelling. Uh, we were able to take those images and use a scanner and turn them what turn them in, from paper to digital, which I think is I get well. It's ha it's it's been happening um, throughout time, but I, I still think it's revolutionary how we can preserve just those images in you know, a computer screen. And it was beautiful how you were able to transform and give new meaning into those images through the animations. I think that that's another sort of thing to gain to gain from that. Armin, how did you feel sharing these uh, archives with these young students? I, I, I loved it. And they didn't drop one of the glass plate <laughs> negatives, you know, which, uh, of course, uh, is always a possibility. But uh, I do have a few cracked ones, but uh, they, they were they must have been uh, one of the ones that got bounced around on the ship. Uh, but I, I much, much enjoyed it. Uh, I know that Bridget didn't tell tell us much about her her film um, because they became storytellers themselves. And 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 being, you know, in a way, when you tell tell a story, you're you're in a sense, you become part of the history and it's part of your identity i know both both with jonathan and, and bridget you went and you were uh interviewing your your parents and finding out things about your own experience and that's something that that i did but i wish i did a lot more of it when i was was younger uh and uh fortunately both my 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 mother and my uncle uh did extensive interviews uh about their experiences and this is this is a lesson for all of us. You know, we're we're in our busy world. Uh, we have all other all things to take care of in the course of the day, but it's very important to you know to sit back and and speak with the members of your family and your friends about their their story, because that's you know that's what makes us human, and that's what that's what I think is important in the the bigger picture of this project. Uh, Jonathan was saying it's amazing how you can take these physical objects and digitalize them. But the other amazing thing is that it allows you to share them around the world with people right. and to share the stories in ways that, you know, you couldn't share 40, 50 years ago. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a pleasure to be able to share this material. It's been my goal from the beginning a decade ago when I started reading about the family. And saying, "Boy, these are amazing pictures, amazing stories. This this needs to be told." Uh, and they were a great, great group of students to work with. Um, and uh, I, I, I miss miss do, miss those Friday mornings driving up to Yukon early in the morning to join the, the class. Yeah, really yes. incredible, particularly in the way, I, you know, I'm thinking about the 180 viewers we had for the film. I mean, the fact that you all made a film, you know, and, and Catherine certainly knows much about how long distribution takes in, in the film uh, circuit. 
Um, it's incredible that we've been able to share with um, people from all around the world I saw in, in the comments. So that is a big, a big plus. And, and also the sharing of those personal testimonies and your own family history and the universality in, in sharing those is, is astounding. Mm -hmm. um, so one more question specifically to the students. Um, what, what was your biggest takeaway? I mean, you covered a lot of material and a lot of concepts, but um, is there a contribution that you made to the film, for example, that you're most proud of? Or was there one sort of thing that came into your heart that, that it st will stick with you, you think, for the future? Yeah, um, if, I, if my, if my uh, peers don't mind me going first again. Um, I The thing that was probably the most impactful for me is something that's probably you know, still a little bit, you know, there, there's varying opinions of in the historical sphere. I had a great time doing the recoloration, of the historical photographs. Um, and that's, you know, that's a bit of a contested topic because there is some talk of, okay, well, is that the original photograph anymore? You know, are you modifying the history that it included? And I think the most important takeaway is just transparency and saying this isn't the original photograph but you know this is a new interpretation of it and this is just another way of telling a story so that it's more relatable to people similar to how we took the physical pictures and put them into a movie it's the it's the same thing um but just just the ability to you know put that kind of more you know quote unquote modern touch onto something that you know was so that happened so long ago was just incredibly powerful and also incredibly satisfying just from a technical standpoint. It was definitely something that I never really pictured myself doing because I always thought it would, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours to painstakingly go over every pixel. Uh, you don't have to do that, but you certainly can, but you don't have to. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably the biggest uh, takeaway for me in terms of, you know, what, what I actually worked on, but the, the entire course in and of itself was just incredibly enlightening and i cannot speak highly enough of it um one of our uh one of our classmates who isn't here right now uh he did his um he did his like creative project actually on knowledge of the armenian genocide and how many college students knew about it or knew anything about it really and it was very low so i'm i'm very very grateful that i have an opportunity to learn about you know something that clearly has this much of a historical importance to so many people that we wouldn't have learned otherwise can i interject something for aiden uh, you talk about colorization well it was done by my ancestors this is a color this is a photo that was painted. So, uh, you know, my grandfather would appreciate the fact that, you know, this is not the original photo. This was this was uh, taken and, and painted and and uh, made into a color photo. So, <laughs> old, old tech say, new tech. What? Yeah. Old tech and new tech. That's old tech. You know. Yeah, they both were painstaking processes, but uh, you know, and it took talent and uh, on both both your part and and my ancestors' part. Uh, Jonathan or Bridget, did you have um, something to share about your biggest takeaway from the class? Uh, yeah, so similar to what Aiden was saying, my biggest takeaway was definitely uh, the erasure and like the lack of knowledge surrounding this issue. Um, before I walked into that class, I called myself a human rights minor and knew very, very little about the Armenian genocide. Um, and I walked away with a lot of knowledge and being able to handle the archives, um, which also was my uh, my favorite part of the class. Uh, like I said, I did a lot of the scanning of documents and organizing, um, and that was my favorite part to kind of uh, read through all the memoirs, um, try and transcribe them, um, and scanning them was a really fun process. Uh, I had to be very careful and wear gloves, uh, but I had a great time doing it and it was a very unique experience and I'm glad that I had. Yeah, I can say the same about the experience that I got and how much 
I didn't really know about the Armenian genocide, you know. I came into the class wanting to, knowing that it was a documentary class, but I didn't really know about what I was going to learn. You know, I think uh, the amount of stuff that from the images from the museum that I've, that we saw, it was just all that I can just take into, into my, into what I know now. And just, um, now I think I'm more aware about, um, what's happening outside globally. And I think that's, it, it is important for us to learn about that. Um, on a technical point, um, I think what I really most enjoyed was just the collaborative process between the students and the professors and just trying to create a story about uh, the Armenian genocide. And I think it's one of the most difficult parts on my case was the uh, trying to get all the clips together uh, for the final for the final movie because a lot because we're college students so we all have our own own classes our own jobs and stuff so it, it was it was a bit tricky trying to schedule times where we could all meet and collaborate outside of class um, but I think we did a really good job and it turned out great I would agree with you I think we have a really powerful film. So I'm going to switch gears and get more to the historical aspects of, of the film and the content. And we've got several questions from the audience, but I want to start off um, with reading the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's definition of genocide, which they call an internationally recognized crime where acts are committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. Now, considered the first major modern genocide, and as we know, this there have been many since. We don't we, we think of the Holocaust, but there's been so many genocides, and genocide is still happening today, which is why we have our human rights major, um, for example, at UConn. Um, oops, I just moved up here. Um, the Armenian genocide resulted in the systemic system, uh, systematic extermination of the majority of the Armenian population within the Ottoman Empire and the subsequent expulsion of survivors from Turkey. Students, were you already familiar with this horrific event in history? Or if not, um, or if you were, what did you learn about the Armenian genocide and discrimination from the project? Um, I think I, I was I was loosely familiar with it. I knew that it had occurred. It was definitely not something that was covered in, you know, my my high school history courses. Um, you know, e even even in upper levels of of history, there's still I'm focus on quote unquote Western history of of Europe and of America, um, and not a lot of attention or less attention than deserved is paid to the Middle East and Africa and, and Asia. Um, so most, if not all, that I know about the Armenian genocide, I learned in this class, and I had an opportunity to learn a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> somebody's spinning there. <laughs> and we're back. OK. Um, Anyone else want to, to talk about that? I, I know you mentioned one of the other students actually made um, a, a documentation of students' lack of knowledge on the college campus, you said, which would be a wonderful um, piece to share as well. Bridget or Jonathan, were you very aware of what happened in Armenia in 1915? Uh, I personally was not. I knew that the Armenian genocide had occurred. Um, I didn't know the details of the atrocities that had happened. Um, throughout this class, we had multiple readings for homework. Um, Professor Marsubian spoke on it, and we watched multiple films. And throughout all of, uh, those assignments and whatnot, um, I definitely learned a lot more about like the individual things that happened, um, kind of the things that most people would know about the Holocaust. We now learned about uh, the Armenian Genocide, and so it was extremely enlightening. And I everything I know about the Armenian genocide is because of this class. Okay, so we've got um, some questions from the audience, so I want to bring uh, bring that up. Um, and this might be, Armin, a little bit more in your wheelhouse here. 
Um, Fuel Flow 1954 said, glad to see their interest in documenting history. They mentioned deportation of Armenians, but did that mean that they just killed them or did they did not actually send uh, any of them anywhere? What does the word deportation mean in the context of the Armenian genocide? There we go. The, yeah, the, uh, the, the official process was relocation. And that was the euphemism for uh, de deportation. Uh, and the deportation uh, involved actually the extermination of the majority of the Armenians. Uh, many of the male members of the uh, uh, town were gathered up ahead of time, and they were they were executed even before the deportation started. Most of the deportations were uh, children, women, old people. They were deported under horrific conditions. Most of them did not make it to their destination, and their destination were concentration camps in the Syrian desert. And once they were there in the following year, in 1916, many of those concentration camps became extermination camps. Um, but I can go in much, much greater detail, but uh, members, you, you see in the, in the film that many of the images of the members of the family have survived, but others didn't. And a number of these were uh, on the deportations and uh, they never made it, never made it to, to Syria. So um, Jeffrey Bluestein was asking uh, to Armin, does the college and hospital, uh, Antolia College and Hospital still exist in Marzava? Oh, Jeff, <laughs> he's, uh, he's a philosopher friend of mine. The uh, parts of the college still exist. The hospital is there. It's, it's now a high school. Uh, I had an opportunity to visit it on two occasions and talk with some of the students there in the English class. And I donated photographs of the building uh, and the college to the school, to the high school. And they hang in the hallways of the school with proper captions. The, the, the principal of the school didn't have any idea that it had been a hospital, that wow. it was part of Anatolia College, that my grandfather worked in the hospital because back then, Photographers also ran X-ray machines, and the first X-ray machine in that area was in that hospital. Um, so uh, many of those uh, high school students came to the first exhibition we had in Marzavan of, of photographs, and uh, it was it was a great experience to meet them and to see their interest in their own community because it's a history that's been kept silent. Uh, it's been uh, intentionally kept from generations of uh, Turkish citizens. Um, and we've got another uh, question here from, and I apologize if I get the pronunciation wrong here, Siron Tau, 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 Tau Um In the Ottoman Empire, the Armenians were known to be the best photographers. Were the Armenian photographers limited in any way by the Turkish government in pre-genocidal Armenia? No, they weren't limited. Uh, they were uh, among the photographers. They were the dominant ethnic group. They were also Greek photographers. And in the bigger cities in Istanbul, uh, in Constantinople, they were uh, Levantine and, and, and non-Turkish uh, Ottoman uh, photographers. But they, they actually had a certain kind of freedom because they traveled a lot. Uh, it wasn't a studio necessarily where people would come and get their photo, which we, we had a studio, but they would travel to towns and villages in the Anatolian interior. Um, and during the genocide, because of the photography, my grandfather survived, and he did travel and witness a lot of what was going on in the interior. And he, and he witnessed some hor horrific things as a, as a result of his uh, uh, being able to travel. Of course, he was able to travel because he was in the Ottoman army. Mm. 
working as a, as a military photographer. But in general, I would say that they had greater flexibility in terms of, of travel. Other citizens, army and citizens, you would need an internal passport to go from one town to another. Yeah, those photos were pretty amazing to, uh, of your relatives with the, with the military as well. Um, were the individuals with disabilities identified by the Turks and treated experimentally or differently than other Armenians, or was it just a discrimination um, universally? And that was from Ellen Sefronsky asking that question. I don't I don't believe there was anything unique in terms of the treatment of people with disabilities. Uh, as Armenians, they obviously had a much uh, poorer chance of survival in the deportations. Um, so I, I I don't they weren't singled out as they were in, in the Holocaust. Uh, and, and just a footnote, the Aram Dildilian, the brother of my Grandfather Tsolog, as you know from the maybe from the film, he had a disability because he had an artificial leg, um, but he was he was able to continue as a, uh, helping my grandfather as a photographer, and that didn't slow him down at all prior to the genocide in, in the United States, where he continued photography in in San Francisco. Wow. But it it did cause a problem in 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 entering the United States because we had, we were, uh, we were prejudiced against people with disabilities. Uh, you know. Absolutely. Um, Daniel Adler is asking also, Armin, could you share any specific details from your grandfather's journal regarding the genocide and the flight of your family that tonight's participants might find of, of interest, you know, beyond the film? Uh, well, <laughs> I've written a whole book about it, so uh, there are so many details in it uh, that you know I can't just pick out one thing. But one of the one of the most upsetting moments in 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 the story that I tell is the day where he took a photograph in his studio of an army officer who came and in the conversation with my grandfather revealed that he was in a neighboring town where my grandfather's brother was a uh, brother was younger brother was living at the time and my grandfather discovers from this officer that this officer was responsible for the execution of his brother uh, and the officer apologized because he he said, I didn't know it was your brother. If I knew it was your brother, I would have sent him to you. Um, but just thinking of the moment where, you know, you're taking this photograph of, of someone who, who executed, who's responsible for the killing of your, your younger brother, um, and, and being able to hold back your anger because you know that it would not do anybody any good at that point in the family's safety was was at risk um there there are other moments like that that uh, i found quite uh quite upsetting in in learning learning the story of what was what happened to them but they were also very very um uh uplifting moments where they uh they did some amazing things to save others in the process as you saw in the film uh they rescued uh, many young men and women in the, in the course of the genocide. Um, Heinrich Guter is asking, specific to Armenian identity, what role does family history play in the general identity of Armenians today? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it, there, there is a, because of the nature of the diaspora and the fact that Armenians are, are scattered around the world, I think family stories play a, play a great role um, that Armenians traditionally 
have identified with the landscape, the places, the villages. Armenians that get together second, third generation even, when they realize that this is an Armenian, they, are, they, they identify where they're from, a sapasatsi, you know, karpetsi, where, where, where you came from, because you know, there is this, this, uh, this longing for place, and it, it gets passed down in many generations. Of course, there are families that, you know, that through assimilation are not, not as uh, tuned into their ancestry, but what what's happened, I think, and there are different projects now in the Armenian community. There's something called the Armenian Genealogy Project, where Armenians are very uh, interested in these stories. They're very interested in tracing their family history, their roots. This is a general phenomenon, I think, that's going on in in the United States. But Armenians, in particular, are are quite quite concerned about finding out what had happened because there was also a period of time where there was a silencing both both on the part of the perpetrators but there was a sense of of armenian uh who had immigrated to the united states and other communities where they they needed to make sure that they could survive and they didn't want to burden the next generation with some of the the horrors that had happened to them, um, but I think it, at this point there's a there's a great interest among Armenians uh, about their ancestors, and uh, in part that's what I I like to do when I go and give talks to the Armenian community. People always come up to me and ask me, "Did your family know so and so? They're from the same village or town. Do you have a picture of?" And I most of the time I can't can't help them, you know. Uh, you know, they were my family only was able to preserve certain certain photographs. Um, but but other times they bring photographs. They bring photographs uh, that my grandfather took uh, of their family from from the old country, as they say. Um, yeah, it's fascinating because I, um, you know, UConn has a special relationship with Yerevan State University, and uh, I had the privilege of going there for the 100th anniversary, which was remarkable because, you know, that university was literally born out of the Armenian genocide right after and sort of was seen as the, the hope. But it was wonderful speaking with the professors, and they really talked about how when they asked the students where they were from, they still all go back as a family and talk about their pre-genocidal town. So they'll stay, they're from this area that's now in Turkey, or they're from here, you know, even though they may have lived for many generations now in Yerevan or one of the areas within the current borders of Armenia. So it's really interesting to, to think about how that family history um, still lives and, and is supported um, in each of them. We've got time for about two more questions from the audience, and then we'll, um, go to introduce our, our special uh, guests tonight and our sponsors. Um, I'm going to, to, to say a little, we all know this thing, uh, this little uh, quote, hopefully you've heard it. Um, this is, a, uh, I'm gonna read this and I'm gonna ask you what your thoughts are on that for the students in, in particular and as professors, because I think we're all here for educational purposes and the reasons why we do this work. Human rights champion and a Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel said in his 1986 Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. So what does this mean to you today? students, professors, personally? Students? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's more important than ever. Um, we're, we're seeing ongoing social movements across the country and across the world. Um, and, you know, as, as time goes on and we, we see all this history and, you know, say, oh, these are these are terrible atrocities. How could anybody have done this when 
you know, the people who are doing this are, you know, just just over an ocean or sometimes even, you know, right there in your country. Um, so I think it's important almost to recognize that in this quote, referring to to you, you are the one who has to, get, uh, you know, stay away from neutrality. You are the one who has to speak up and and witness and acknowledge that these things are happening and further that you have to do something about it um you know it, it doesn't matter if it's big or if it's small but because uh, uh thousands of small things make one really big thing um so it's important to do what you can and sometimes spreading the word is you know a, a, just a, an entirely you know, valid, valid thing to do to take action, as long as you, you know, follow up with it and make sure that something actually happens as a result. This, this is, this is referred to in the, in the field of genocide studies as bystander studies. And uh, as we all know, including this, especially so with the Holocaust, that without, without people who were bystanders who didn't speak up, horrific things happen. It's not just the people that are committing the crimes, but they they see that no one is saying anything. And and there's a whole uh, field now called bystander studies that that now is applying this to behavior, not just in these big examples of crimes against humanity, but in examples of even police training in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the fact that officers, when they see fellow officers doing something that they know is wrong, how they could just stand aside and not say anything and, you know, feel that they're breaking a code or risking their own career, their training programs that come out of the study in genocide genocide studies are now being applied in, in police training uh, to break this passive bystander and make it an active bystander. Um, uh, or what the term now is called upstander yeah. as opposed yeah. to bystander. Catherine? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I also feel that um, that it's very important to look at this story of the Dildilians and the Armenian genocide is also in in one way or another the story of us all, right? If it's if, whether it's in our own personal lives, the, our family stories, our community stories, or our our national stories, um, you know, we 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 need to connect those dots and not other the suffering of other people but feel that personal sense of responsibility because it is also our own suffering. And I think that was also the idea again behind having students also transpose the experience of telling the Armenian story or the Dildilian story to their own stories, to the stories that they wanted to tell. Um, so, you know, that's sort of my takeaway also from the course as well is the power of doing that. and. You know, it's it's also kind of a, a vision that I had that was somewhat cut short, I would say, by the pandemic, but of, you know, this film going on, uh, having its own life um, in in another way, uh, which is that um, particularly, you know, the young people who had the experience of making it or were in one way or another involved with this story can take this to other young people and and share it. Um, you know, maybe through the genocide, genocide education project, which is in, you know, part of the state mandate in Connecticut, um, that, you know, it can be taken into the schools and, you know, maybe, um, you know, those students are here um, and those who aren't, maybe they can be part of that effort as well. Um, you know, because then it just brings a, a different dimension to it. This, again, sort of bringing this uh, sort of sense, not only that, the Armenian story is our story, but also that the story of our ancestors is also our story in the present, that we carry that, pre that past into the present 
and into the future with us. And with that caring comes a sense of responsibility to continue to bear witness to this history. So Sita Antakilian would like to know, um, she's a representative for us today with our co-sponsor from Aratat Eskijin Museum. What are the future plans for the film? Because you said that was interrupted, Catherine, but what would you like to ideally see with this? Armin, Catherine, what were you thinking? Well, again, I mean, I just wanted to restate that, um, that, you know, it, it becomes part of a an outreach program in the secondary schools um, in Connecticut and other states also that have a particular focus. I think there are 15 states that now that are signat signatories uh, to the Genocide Education Project. Uh, so, you know, that's that's one starting point. But I think that there are, you know, many other ways. Um, Armin, maybe you can talk about how you see the film as playing a role in outreach to the Armenian community. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I agree that we we want to bring this into classrooms. And uh, I was I was hoping in some of the uh, workshops that I've done with high school teachers in the state of Connecticut to bring this material and also talk to them about projects that they could do with their students around storytelling. Uh, I know they don't have the facilities to do what what we did with this film, but it's an you know it's amazing what people could do with their with their cell phones and their you know so uh, you know I saw uh, unfortunately the pandemic uh, has put a pause on this but I would like to do this uh, with with this with this outreach with the state education department in the mandate for Holocaust and genocide studies and the the other thing I would like to replicate this course if not. Um, at UConn, but at other universities uh, that have the ability to bring in uh, students and have the facilities for for making these sorts of films. Uh, I had hoped that we would be able to share this in uh, in the film in Turkey. I have had I have a person who volunteered just two weeks ago to do all the the subtitles in in Turkish. Uh, but the environment there is not conducive to um, doing anything at the moment with regard to Armenians, unfortunately. It's a sort of setback for me because it was something I've been working on with people in Turkey. Unfortunately, the main sponsor of my work has been sitting in, in jail for three years, Osman Kabbalah. Um, but I hope to live long enough to see a change where this could play a role in 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 uh in turkey um yeah. and uh because well, it's Armin, maybe to, to just talk about the that you know the, that there hasn't been a historical acknowledgement by the current government um you know in turkey about the responsibility of the armenian genocide do you want to just say a couple words? well it, it's not just the current government yeah it everyone was, since <laughs> yeah it was it was it was a denial the denial was part of the process of the genocide to begin with. Uh, it's seen as really fundamental to all genocides. There's there is denial in the process of of of, of committing it. Even in the Holocaust, you know, there were uh, these concentration camp like Terezin, which was supposed to be a relocation and a new Jewish community. So we 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 know all that. Uh, unfortunately. With with Turkey, you know the the denial has gone on for over a hundred years, and it, it, it in particular has gotten worse in recent years. Um, and uh, you know that that's that's the first step, and it's not it's not for the sake of the Armenians that they need to acknowledge the genocide. It's for their own sake, for their own well being, for their yeah. own. The, the 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 terrible human rights history there is a reflection of the denial of the right. Armenian genocide and that's that that's true in other societies um it's the violence uh and the, the way that uh that their own citizens have been treated um and their own minorities after the armenians have been treated is is a reflection of not coming to terms with this 
this history. Yeah, and that was, you know, similar to having been in Eastern Europe. I mean, the pain, even a hundred, more than a hundred years later, is still, you know, mm -hmm. very evident in in Armenia. Mm -hmm. This has been an incredible discussion. I can't thank all of you enough for um, for your contributions and for sharing your your personal stories and um, Armin for sharing those incredible archives and your and, and the privilege for us at UConn to be able to 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 continue to tell your family's history. It's just a really, really incredible, wonderful um, experience. And thank you. Hope to continue that work. Um, for anybody out there, if you do want to support the broader vision of the Armenian Memory Project here at UConn, um, you can donate through the UConn Foundation and email global at uconn.edu. That's global at uconn.edu for more information so that we can continue this very, very important work. Um, I want to give a moment to. Um, uh, introduce our three event co-sponsors here. We've got Mark Monagonian, Director of Academic Affairs for the National Associ Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Soline Saryan, the Executive Director of Project SAVE, who we saw in one of the photographs that Catherine shared, the Armenian Photographic Archives, Inc. And Seda Antakilian, a Volunteer Associate Director at the Ar Ararat Eskandjan Museum. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and read the descriptions of these important organizations for everyone that's out there and would like to know more about the importance of preserving um, Armenian culture here in the United States. So the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, is a nonprofit organization that works to connect Armenian studies scholars with each other and the general public. Since its founding in 1955, it is aimed to build a global community that preserves and enriches Armenian culture, history and identity. Nasser is one of the world's leading Armenian study centers and rare book libraries. Mark, are you there? Would you love to say a few words for us? I would, I would love to, thank you. <laughs> it's easier if I unmute myself. That's right. Uh, it's a real privilege uh, to be part of this event tonight and to represent Nasser and I just wanna say Congratulations to Catherine Masood, to Armen, and to the students who worked on this great project. And I also wanted to thank a few people, uh, Dan Weiner, Glenn Matoma, and Don Swinton from UConn for their initial outreach to Nasser and to me several years back, and to my late in-laws, uh, Satoshi and Jeanette Oishi, uh, UConn alums, class of 1949, not Armenian, uh, who helped bring this connection about as well. But mostly I wanted to salute my friend Armen Marsubian, with whom over the past 15 years that we've known each other, I've had the pleasure of watching the various projects connected with his amazing family archive grow and flourish. So well done, Armen, well done, everyone. And, and thank you so much for, for having me and having Nasser as part of tonight's event. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Project SAVE. Um, Project SAVE Armenian Photograph Archives, Inc. collects, preserves, and shares images and stories from Armenians for public and educational use. Their mission is to promote the photographic heritage of the worldwide Armenian community. Project SAVE supports and collaborates with other historical, cultural, and educational organizations. And we've got Celine here. If you'd like to say, say a few words, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Project Save Archives is is proud to co-sponsor um, the film and this conversation. And really, kudos to the to the students to with your animation and your digital um, uh, coloring and work to really make these images come to life and their stories. Um, today, we are Armenians are seeing our history and and being manipulated and questioned thanks to PR influencing media. And the photographs Project Save Archives has collected, documented, preserved, and makes available provide credible testimony. And we're able to share those images to celebrate Armenian culture and heritage. So again, I'm thank you all of you, and I'm 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 proud to be part of it tonight. Thank you, Soline. And you are still gathering and collecting. If there's any Armenian Americans here that are wanting to donate their resources to Project Save, that's a possibility, right? 
and photographs of all time, um, including contemporary photographs showing Armenian life around the world. Wonderful. And finally, the Ararat Eskijin Museum, AEM, aims to enrich, inspire, and educate the community through the display of cultural artifacts, educational programs, and research archives that share history and heritage of the Amer Armenian people. AEM collects a variety of art and ancient artifacts and encourages the community to take part in preserving family history too. It continues to support research and other educational opportunities surrounding Armenian history and archives. And Seda is here. If you'd like to say a few words, please. Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Seda Antakelyan. And as mentioned, I'm representing the Ararat Eskija Museum of Los Angeles here tonight um, as its volunteer associate director. Um, it's Maggie Mangasarian Goshen, who is the museum's head director, unfortunately, could not join us today. but. I know she echoes me in saying congratulations to you, Armin and Catherine, and your students, for, and all others who were responsible for the success of putting together such a special and educational film. It's been truly wonderful to hear you all speak and share your perspectives on how much you have all learned, and honestly, truly enjoyed working on this project together. I wish I was on the team too. Um, my personal favorite line from the film um, is actually when Armin says something along the lines of these people of the past were just like people like you and me. And it's truly so true. Um, and you all have depicted that through the reality, um, that reality through your work. And just as the museum carries the responsibility to preserve the memory of 20th century Armenian heritage through objects, the Dedelian photographs and this accompanying film also serve this mission and go beyond to humanize the Armenian experience, Armenian cultural landscapes across the Ottoman Empire, as well as the collective will of the Armenian people to survive. And with that, AEM is proud to be a co-sponsor tonight and looks forward to the success of this film in the future as it continues to share the Dizilian family story, their legacy, as well as all sides of Armenian history and culture and life for current and future generations across the globe. So congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank you, and Zara, you are up for the close, and thank you all again for an amazing event, and I look forward to future collaborations between UConn and all of our sponsors. Thank you, everyone, for a truly engaging discussion. I would like to close out tonight's event by thanking everyone involved in this project. Thank you to Heather Elliott Famalaro for moderating today's discussion and along with Vice President for Global Affairs, Daniel Wiener, Dean of Social of the School of Social Work, Nina Robinelli Heller, and Director of the Human Rights Institute, Catherine Leibel, and the Honors Program and DMD for your vision, support of this project and the broader initiative to recreate the, and remember the communities lost to war and genocide around the world. Thank you to our panelists and filmmakers. Catherine Massoud, Armin Marsubian, Aidan Bruckner, Jonathan Pico, Bridget Sweeney, and your classmates for your work on this film and tonight's engaging discussion. Thank you again to our event co-sponsors, Nasser, Project Save Armenian Photograph Archives, and the Arat Iskijian Museum. And thank you to our behind the scenes crew, Marissa Tati Wong, Nikki Hosey, Matthew Larson, and Nick Hampton. And of course, thanks to you, our audience members for tuning in to watch the premiere of this film and asking our panelists some thought provoking questions. Also a reminder that the recording of this event and the film will be on the Norian Armenian Program's website. So to access those materials, you can visit armenia.ukon.edu. Thank you and good night. <laughs>